Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, I do encourage you to follow us using your favorite podcast software. Today's episode of Philo Vance is provided by Radio Archives in much improved audio quality. Radio Archives produces high quality old time radio collections, pulp fiction reprint ebooks, and pulp fiction audiobooks. You can obtain a free sample of each of these products by sending an email to detectives at radioarchives.com. In addition, they have collected and preserved 36,000 old-time radio transcriptions over the last two decades, and they are releasing them to subscribers at a rate of 600 transcriptions per month. And you can sample the first month of transcriptions for $59.98 by going to transfers.greatdetectives.net. And the entirety of your purchase price goes to support the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. And if you like what you hear, you can sign up for a subscription at $60, which is half off the usual price. Well, now let's get into this week's episode of Follow Vance. The original air date, May the 9th, 1950, and the title is The Whistling Murder Case. <laughs> Please, Daniel. I'm sorry, dear. I just can't help being nervous. The man wants $100,000. It's every bit of money we have in the bank. He'll kill you if you don't give it to him, though. He said he would. Oh, give him the money, Daniel. You know what happened to George Morris. I won't do it. I told him I wouldn't do it on the telephone this afternoon. I told him I wouldn't go to the police. But I wouldn't pay him the money either. Oh, Daniel, Daniel, you did the wrong thing. Maybe. Maybe that's what's making me nervous. Oh, my dear. The killer who whistles. Who just whistles and kills. You told him you weren't going to call the police. Yes. I told him I didn't have $100,000, but he, he laughed as if he knew I had. Daniel, I won't have you working yourself into a breakdown. I'm going to call the police. I... Daniel... Those footsteps. Maybe it's our butler. He could be coming downstairs. Daniel, that can't be our butler. You know it can't. It's the killer. It's the whistling killer. Go away. Go away, you. Don't. 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 No, no. Oh, you killed him. You murderer. You fiend. I tell you, Vance, you've got to do something. This isn't any scientific murder series. There aren't any clues. All we know is that three people were murdered by the whistling killer. I know, Markham. Believe me, I understand the complications. Undoubtedly, all three victims, Morrissey and Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Stewart, had been threatened and refused to pay. Why didn't they call me? What good is being a district attorney if people won't call on you for help? By the same token, what good is being a private investigator if there's nothing to work on? Vance, I never heard you talk that way. What else can I do? There isn't a single place for me to begin working. What do we know? Tell me, what do we know? Well, we know the steward's butler heard someone whistle, then shots. He was on the third floor, and by the time he came down to the library, Mr. Stewart was dead, and Mrs. Stewart lived only long enough to say that the killer wanted $100,000. Where does anybody go from there? What do I do? Investigate the butler? No, he's been with the stewards for years. Absolutely beyond reproach. The butler's out, Vance. I know he's out, but who's in? What do we do for suspects? 
How do I find a killer nobody living has ever seen? I don't know, Vance. All I know is that if there's anyone in the world who can do it, that person is you. City desk, Mullins. Joe, Mike. I've got a statement from the DA on the Whistling Killer murders. Give. District Attorney Mark emerges any citizen who was approached by the Whistling Killer to call him immediately in the interest of law and order, etc., etc., etc. The DA asks we put it in a box at page one. I'll take it up to the city editor. Nothing more to the statement? That's it. The usual business about the law being more powerful than any criminal. Police have several leads they're tracking down, you know. Can do. Maybe the item will give the DA something to work on. I guarantee he doesn't have a thing on that whistling killer right now. Sweetie! Oh, sweetie, I've been waiting for you. Oh, honey, it's good to see you. Sit down. Here, here, sit here in your favorite chair. That's it now. Uh, Come on now, honey. Put your feet up uh, right here on the stool. That's better, isn't it? Are you hungry, darling? Uh-huh. Well, I'm going to fix you something super special. Here, let me, let me open you, up your collar, huh? Uh, yeah. Is that better? Now, you sit right there and don't you move. I know you worked very hard last night. I've been reading all about it in the newspapers. Say, you killed three people already. The whole town's looking for you. Nobody knows who you are, but every cop's on the muscle. Don't that scare you? Don't it make you nervous? Don't... Oh, hey, how do you like that? He's fast asleep, just like a baby. No, Markham, not a thing. I this know. This is the most helpless situation I've ever been in. Nobody's called in after that item I had put in the newspapers either, Vance. Does this mean we'll have to wait for somebody else to be killed before we do something about the whistling killer? I sincerely hope not. The very moment you hear any... Mr. Vance, I've got to talk to you immediately. Hello, Please. Vance. Please, Mr. Vance. I'll Hello. call you back, Markham. I have a visitor. Goodbye. Well, it's a little late for me to ask you in, my friend, but... Would you mind closing the door? Vance, my name is Wilbur Jones... I've received a warning. The whistling killer. You've got to do something to help me. I don't dare go to the police. You've got to help me. Somebody has to help me. Take it easy, please, Mr. Jones. I was just talking to the district attorney. We knew the whistling killer would look for another victim. He hasn't been successful in getting any money so far. He's killed three people, and I'm going to be the fourth unless you do something to prevent it. He warned me against going to the police. He said he'd kill me if I did. I don't dare go near the district attorney. I came to you. You've got to help me. How much money does he want? $150,000. Every cent I have in the world. I won't give it to him. I can't. It's taken me years to save it. What right is he to demand I give it to him? Mr. Vance, do something. Please do something. When is the killer going to be in touch with you again? I don't know. He didn't say. He's too smart. He won't take a chance on calling and having the phone call traced. He'll come up to me on the street maybe when I'm alone. He'll kill me. He'll kill me sure, Vance. I don't think he will, Mr. Jones. Something you've told me has given me the first clue I've had on this case. Something I have told you? Yes. I want to telephone the bank where Mr. Stewart kept his money. We know the whistling killer asked Stewart for $100,000. Yes. If I find out one thing at the bank, I'll have the one thing I need to start work on catching him. And you can bank on that. Yes, yes, come in, come in. Hello, Dad. Oh, hello, son. Hi. Well, come on, sit down, sit down. Thanks. But I, I have no time, Dad. I, I'll guess what I came in for. Well, I don't have to guess. How much do you want this time? A hundred bucks, Dad. Oh. A big night tonight. But, Jimmy, you're spending a lot of money lately. Why not? Who taught me to spend money but my ever-loving father? Well, that's not the point. All your fault, Dad. You brought me up wrong. Well, a hundred, Dad? Now, look here, son. I'm not made of now, money. Now, Pop, listen. 
How would you like it if James Whitby Jr. went out with a dollar and 30 cents in his pocket? What would people say about you? This is nothing to joke about, Jimmy. Well, who's joking? James Whitby Jr., young banking executive with a buck 30 in his kick. Is that funny? Oh, all right, Jimmy. I'll give you the money this Thanks, time. Thanks, Dad. I know you would. Um, maybe you won't have to keep shelling out like this, Pop. Not much longer, anyhow. Oh? If uh, plans I have come through, I won't have to ask you for a dime, ever. Come on, Markham, give. Now, Joe, Our I... readers want to know what progress the police have made on the Whistling Killer case. There's nothing I can tell you, Joe, not a thing. When interviewed in his office, the district attorney asserted that the police are running down several clues and an early arrest is anticipated. Want that? No, no, I don't. Well, then you'd better get... Joel, can I tell you something off the record? Well, it's against my better judgment, but go ahead. Milo Vance called me on the telephone a little while ago. Vance? Yes. He said he had found a connection between Daniel Stewart, the man who was killed with his wife, and another man who shall be nameless, who came to him after being threatened by the whistling killer. Oh, you mean there is a break coming up in this case? If you don't print that. You know Vance, Joe. You know all he needs is one little opening and he'll crack this thing wide open. That's right. Just between you and me, an early arrest is anticipated. At least by me. Mr. Whitby, you were the head of the Leighton Bank for many years, weren't you? Uh, yes, Vance. Yes, yes, I was. I, I still have an interest in it. Uh, why do you ask? You knew Daniel Stewart? Well, I met him. He was a client of the bank. Hmm. I have a very important question to ask you. Oh? Uh, well, go ahead by all means. Your bank has two branches. That's right. What official of your company would have knowledge of the depositors in both branches? I don't think I know what you mean. Well, I guess I haven't been very clear. Uh, let's say that I had $100,000 in your Main Street branch. Yes. And a friend of mine had, let's say... 200,000 in your Maple Street branch. Uh huh. How many people would know both figures? Oh, well, now let me see. Oh, I imagine none of the tellers would know about both branches. I know that. Well, the vice president in charge of accounts would have supervision over both branches, then. And who is he? Uh, my son. Anyone else, Mr. Whitby? Now, let me think. There's. Get uh... down! Down on the floor! Did you get hit, Mr. Whitby? No. No, I didn't. Well, come on. Let's get after whoever fired those shots. All right. I'm with you. You couldn't have gotten very far. We'll get out this door and... Uh, no. It's locked. Whoever did it was pretty cute. Locked the door from the outside. Mr. Whitby, have you received any communication from the whistling killer? Well, have you? Yes. Yes, I have. That's what I thought. I'm on the right track, anyhow. Only one thing puzzles me right now. Well, uh, what is that, Vance? In all probability, that was the whistling killer who fired those shots. But I wonder why he didn't whistle. Stop it! What are you hitting me for? I didn't say I was going to do it. I only said I might if you didn't treat me. Cut it out. Cut it out. Cut it out. Cut it out. Will you... I... Where are you going? Where are you going? Clip me, will you? What for? What did I do? Nothing, that's what. Well, now I'm really going to give you something to clip me about. Who do you think you are anyway? You clip me for nothing. Well, you're never going to do that again, I can tell you. District Attorney Markham speaking. I've got something to spill to you. Who is this? This is a dame who's calling up to do you a great big favor. Yes? Markham, you're trying to find out who the whistling killer is, aren't you? We most certainly are. Do you know? Who is it? It's a guy who's going to be awful sorry that he... He what? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> he what? Hello, what's the trouble? Hello, are you still there? Hello? What were you trying to say now, just a moment ago? I didn't get you. Wrong. you. Hello? Oh. Hello? Hello, what's happened? Hello? Hello, are you there? Hello? 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 
Now? This is District Attorney Markham. The Whistling murder case concerns the killing by an unknown extortionist of several people, the most recent of whom was shot while talking on the telephone to me. Philo Vance, appealed to for help by a man named Wilbur Jones, uncovered something that sent him to a former banker named James Whitby, and from Whitby learned that his son, James Jr., knew the exact deposits several of the victims maintained in their bank accounts. He's about to explain the significance of this to me in my office, and I am very happy. It's reasonably simple, Markham. Just before she died, Mrs. Stewart was able to tell her butler that the whistling killer had demanded $100,000. Yes, I know. That 100000 represented every cent Stewart had in the bank. Somebody knew that. Or it was a coincidence. Well, it might have been, except that the Wilbur Jones who came to me told me that the whistling killer had demanded exactly the same amount as he had in the bank. And both Jones and Stewart used the same bank, although different branches. Oh, I think I'm beginning to understand. And I'm frank to say it's about time I did. We almost had a break on this case, that phone call I got from the girl who was shot. She didn't live long enough to talk. We'll make our own break, Markham. As you know, James Whitby told me that his son would know how much depositors in both branches of the bank would have in their accounts. But I've uncovered the strangest thing. Yes? Yes. I discovered that Mr. Jones is a director of the bank, and that he too might very easily have access to the accounts. You mean the man who came to you for help is a suspect? Why not? That device has been tried before, pretending to be a victim so that suspicion is removed. I've got to do some more checking. I want to find just how many people would know about the deposits in both bank branches. Then I have a plan to make the whistling killer show his hand. It sounds very interesting if one of the bank employees is the killer. Mm. What goes on from here, Vance? I go on from here, Markham. On to a series of questions with which I won't bore you. The next time you hear from me, I'll have some answers for you. <laughs> Mr. Jones in. Who uh, shall I say is calling, please? James Whitby, Jr. Uh, one moment, please. Hello, hello. What is it, what is it? Uh, Mr. James Whitby, Jr. to see you, Mr. Jones. Whitby? No, no. I won't see him. Very well, sir. Uh, wait. Wait just a moment. Maybe I'd better uh, send him in. Uh, yes, sir. Through that door, Mr. Whitby. Thanks. Hello, Jones. Come in. Now, listen, Whitby, I don't want you to do anything foolish. I want you to listen to me for Just a minute. Just hold the phone, Jones. I came to see you, remember? I know what you came about, but you've got to give me time. Let's start from the beginning. Well, I walked in here for one reason, Jones, because I want you to lay off my father. What? That's it. Lay off my dad. What are you talking about? He told me a shot was fired at him when he was talking to Philo Vance yesterday. I know that. The whistling killer fired that shot. Is that what you think? Yes, and you're the whistling killer. What? I... I figured it all out. When I told Vance about the amount of money I was asked for, he figured it was somebody at the bank. You know how much everybody has deposited. You've got to be the killer. Oh, you me alone or I'll call for help. That's a good act you're doing. Me. But you have as much opportunity to look at our accounts as I have. You know the amounts each depositor has. <sighs> okay. But I'll give you a break, Jones. You lay off my father... And I won't tell anybody what I know. What you know? Just what is it you know? That you're the whistling killer, of course. Markham speaking. This is Vance, my friend. I've been waiting for your call, Vance. It means you've asked all your questions, doesn't it? It most certainly does. Are there any newspaper men in your office at the moment? There generally are. A few within call. Why? I want you to make an announcement to them, Markham. Here's what I want you to say. Hey, quit pushing. Quit pushing. What's the matter? You think you're on the whole train? Oh, shut up. Get lost. A guy can't come home from work in the subway reading his paper without getting into an argument. Well, just give me a little room to read my paper. There won't be no argument. Okay, so you got room. So shut up. Go ahead, read. Big front page story. Yeah? What about? Oh, read it yourself. You kept shoving to get yourself room to read. Somebody's pushing me from the other side. What's on the front page? First I get shoved around. Now I got to read to the guy. 
It's about the whistling killer. Hey. Yeah, you could say that again. Only this time, he didn't kill nobody. This time, the papers say he made a date to call on Philo Vance. You ever hear of Philo Vance? Yeah, sure. Who hasn't? That killer's got some nerve fooling around with Vance. So he's got some nerve. So what? When's he going to see Vance? Ah, uh, the paper says the guy called Vance and said he... Oh, oh sorry, this is my stuff. Oh, well, you got room now. Read it from your own paper. I, uh... I could use another C-note, Dad. What? Yeah. Another hundred. Another hundred? Look here, boy. I gave you $100 the other night. I guess you did, but it's gone. I, I meant to ask you for it today down at the bank, but you left before I had a chance. Well, you might as well know this. I'm not giving you any more money, Jimmy. But, Dad... I, I don't have it. Come on now, Dad. Let's stop with that talk. You've got plenty of dough. You've got stocks, bonds... I you... don't have any more. You don't? What happened? The wrong stocks went up. The wrong ones went down. So what's the difference? You've got plenty of cash... Come on, Pop, a hundred. That's all I need, a hundred. No. And that's definite. Uh, Pop, you wouldn't want me... Who's there? Philo Vance. Philo Vance. What does he want here? Open the door and see. What's the matter, Jim? What are you afraid of? Nothing. Nothing. I'll open it. Hold it, Vance. I'm on the way. Well? You're young Whitby. Well? That's my son, Vance. He doesn't seem particularly pleased to see me. How are you, Mr. Whitby? I'm pretty well, thank you. Oh, what do you want here, Vance? I? I merely want to invite you over to my office, young man. What for? To meet the Whistling Killer. What? You... What, what are you talking about? Just that. The Whistling Killer is calling on me. Your son won't be alone. Uh, Mr. Wilbur Jones will be there and District Attorney Mark. Well, you... Well, what do you want with me? I... I'm not going there. I won't go. I think you can convince him differently, can't you, Mr. Whitby? Well... My office in an hour. Perhaps, perhaps you ought to bring your son, Mr. Whitby. Just to make sure he gets there, of course. I tell you, Mr. Markham, I have work to do tonight at the bank. But There's Mr. no reason Jones... for me to be here at Vance's office jeopardizing my life. He's right. You can say that again. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, and my apologies to you, Mr. Whitby, and your son. Vance said he'd be here at 8 o'clock. It's only 7.30 now. Well, look, what's all this business about the whistling killer? Vance believes the killer will keep his word and be here, providing we don't have the building surrounded by police. And we're doing without any policemen for that reason. Well, I don't think I understand, Mr. Markham. I can explain it partially, I believe. Mr. Whitby, the whistling killer has been in touch with you demanding money. Yes, yes, he has. I, I told that to Vance. And you, Mr. Jones? Well, Vance knows that. I told him the killer was after me. What is he trying to do? Set me up here in this office to make it easy for him? I honestly don't know what Vance is trying to do. Mr. Whitby, Jr.? Well? No threat from the whistling killer to you? Well, what could he get out of me? Which, which leads me to ask, what am I doing here? I'm sure Vance will explain that. He was most anxious to have you. I believe he called on you in person, didn't he? So? So I'm quite certain. Wait. Wait, listen. It's the whistling killer. The whistling killer? Uh, he, he's coming here? He's coming here to kill me. Markham, you have a gun. You must have a gun. No, no, I don't carry one. Now get down behind Vance's desk. That's for me. I'm with you. Come on, Jim. You're done. Okay. Dad, Dad. Come on. I'm staying here, son. I want to get this over with. Dad, don't be crazy. He'll kill you. Dad, he'll... Vance. What? what? Well, What's going on I've never heard of anything so ridiculous in my what life. What is this? When everybody is quite through reprimanding me for it's pretending to be the whistling killer, I'll explain all well, this. I should think you would. Yes. Thank you very much. This little experiment was very necessary, gentlemen. Definitely necessary. All right, all right. It was necessary to scare all of us to death. But what did it prove? What did it prove, Mr. Whitby? That's what I said. Nothing very much. Except that you are the whistling killer. Well, Vance, he's going for a gun. No, Dad, hey, no, no more killing. Get my arms, you fool. Let go. Let I'm me afraid get... you'd better help the young man, Markham. All after right, which I'm on. sure you'll see to it that the whistling uh. killer talks. What's the point of my denying it? I'm the whistling killer. 
Although how you knew, how I gave myself away, I'll never know, Vance. It so happens that I don't know either would be. Vance? Let's see if I can start from the beginning of this case and bring it right up to date. I'll admit that some of this is pure supposition. But I believe you lost all your money in the stock market. Correct, Mr. Whitby? It's your story, Vance. It's correct. Thank you, Markham. Anyhow, Whitby hit upon the idea of the whistling killer, an idea that would cloak his identity. He investigated the bank accounts of his friends, found just how much cash they were worth, and went to work. There was a girl killed, wasn't there, Vance? How do you explain that? That, Whitby, was your girlfriend, of course. You two probably had a falling out. Incidentally, when Markham was talking to her on the phone, just as you shot her, he heard your whistle, which was how I could imitate it in my office. You still haven't told me how you found me. I will. There are some details to fill in. One of them was the shot that was fired when you and I were together, Whitby. You see, your son knew you were the killer. I'm sure he did. He fired that shot, missing purposely just to throw me off. Young Whitby knew about his father? I think so. He went to see my client, Wilbur Jones, and accused him of being the whistling killer to keep Jones from suspecting Mr. Whitby here. After all, there are only three men who had access to the accounts in both branches of the bank, the two Whitbys and Jones. As you say, Vance, this is all hypothetical, although it does sound completely logical. But let's get back to your office when you named Whitby here. How could you do that? When I, impersonating the whistling killer, came to the door, Markham, you and young Whitby and Jones were behind my desk. Only Whitby here was in the open, with a much-feared killer closing in. Why would he stay out in the clear? No reason, Vance. One reason. Because he knew it wasn't the whistling killer at all. It couldn't be. He was the whistling killer, so he knew he had nothing to fear. He realized it was a trick. Oh. So that's how I gave myself away, huh? Yes. You imagined the killer would do just that, didn't you, Vance? I hoped he would. But we were in the middle of this case before I got the idea for it. It doesn't matter that you got the idea in the middle, Vance. It only matters that we've reached the end of the whistling murder case. Welcome back. There is really something unsettling about that whistling before and after the murder. That was pretty effective. I also had to appreciate the two passengers cramped together on the subway cars to react to the minor plot point in the newspaper. It was padding of a plot that was kind of thin, but it was fun padding. On the other hand, trying to blackmail people out of their whole account was kind of dumb. Not only did the exact account balance serve as the only lifeline the police or file advance could get in this case, but people are not likely to give up every penny they have. As to how Vance solved the case, okay, so let me understand here. The killer did not hide because he knew who the whistling murderer was, and he knew it was him. His son, on the other hand, had known, and that's why he fired the shot and tried to throw suspicion on the bank board member, and he hid 
he knew his dad was the killer and that his dad was inside and couldn't have been out in the hall whistling. But the whistling scared him anyway? Uh, Okay, some logic uh, problems in that conclusion. Well, we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we start with an email from Derek, who writes, On the latest Philo Vance episode, I think the shoe designer sounds like Mr. Chameleon. Any chance I'm right? Oh my, Mr. Chameleon, you are a master of disguise. Well, Tim, I will uh, say this. I I think you could be right. But I'm not 100% sure. I'm not the best at recognizing actor voices, particularly someone like Carl Swenson, who really did have the ability to play a lot of different voice roles, and who also did most of his work in New York where the voices are not nearly as familiar, but it's certainly possible because Swenson was working in New York. Of course, he was starring in Mr. Chameleon at the time, but starring in one detective series didn't really stop actors from going and appearing in another series. So while I can't confirm it, Swenson, it's not far-fetched that it could have been. And then we turn to Facebook, and Emmett, who writes uh, regarding the same episode, this was one of the better Philo Vance stories. Oh, I know the script is utterly silly, but for Philo, this is top drawer. Well, thanks so much, Emmett, and I'd agree that that was a pretty good story for Philo Vance, and I am once again really grateful to Radio Archives for sharing their copy because we wouldn't have been able to play it otherwise because the one in circulation was only half there. So I'm so glad that you enjoyed it and it was a really good episode for Philo Vance. Well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to thank Dawn. Dawn has been one of our Patreon supporters since October 2021, currently supporting us at the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Dawn. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And please be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. Philo Vance will return in two weeks, taking next week off for our celebration of the 110th birthday of Bob Bailey. But join us back here tomorrow for the conclusion to The Flight Six Matter, where... Do you happen to know this girl, Marvel Terrence? Uh, By sight, I mean. She has been pointed out to me. Mm -hmm. Did you see her at the airport? See, I did. I was under the impression she was going to leave on the plane... But after it departed, she was still in the terminal. Did you notice her talking to anyone before the takeoff? Yes, to some American, I believe. Red hair, stocky build, about uh, 35? See, he would fit that description. Blakely. Did you see her talking to anyone else? Uh, Any of the baggage handlers or the ground crew? I'm afraid I did not notice. Is it important? It could be. Well, uh, thanks for your information, Don Serrano. My only concern is to see justice done. I'm sure it will be. And now suppose we take a look at what you didn't tell me. Senor? The fact that Maria took out a flight accident policy for $25,000 and named you as her beneficiary. I considered it a a mere whim of my sister's. But the way things turned out, it was a pretty valuable whim, wasn't it, Don Serrano? For you, I mean. Senor, are you implying... I'm implying that Ramon wasn't the only one with a motive... Wasn't the only one who will profit by Maria's death. You'll do pretty well yourself. Half her estate and $25,000 cash, that's not a bad deal. I should kill you for such an insult. You'd like to, wouldn't you? You're very big on this killing business. That's how you planned to handle things with Ramon, wasn't it? As soon as Maria went back to Havana. It is only what he deserves. And now you're trying to use me to do it. That's why you came here. You don't care about justice. All you want to do is get Ramon. He is guilty. If he is, Don Serrano, I'll find it out and I'll pin it on him. But if he isn't, I'm not going to be pushed into framing him. So you can take these dirty, underhanded insinuations of yours and you can... Get out, Don Serrano. 
I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.